Correct. <clears throat> well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Chatham House. It's wonderful to see such a packed audience. I know that a lot of people are also watching the live stream of this event. So wherever you are, however you're participating this evening, it is very good to have you. This is part of a series of events taking historical perspectives on current affairs to mark the 100th anniversary of Chatham House in 2020. And so what we want to do this evening is to take a very contemporary event, and Brexit is almost inescapable in the world around us, and to think about how we can historicize that and so where it might sit in the past. So we're going to think about the different ways that Brexit might, sorry, that history might be used in the Brexit debate. We'll think about how memories of empire or the Second World War or the idea of Britain as a country that stands alone might feed particular visions of Britain's place in the world. We might also think about how historians tackle a question like Brexit and what questions it might pose for the study of history itself. We've got three excellent speakers this evening who are going to steer us through these questions and each of them brings an expertise in a different aspect of Britain's historical relationship with the wider world. So I'm going to introduce each of them and then they will each speak for exactly nine minutes, I am assured, and then we'll open up the floor for your questions. Just before I introduce them, I've been asked to remind you that this evening's event is on the record. You are warmly encouraged to tweet along using the hashtag CHEvent. And if we need to vacate the building for any reason or if we need any kind of technical assistance, there are a number of members of staff from Chatham House dotted around the room. So I'm going to introduce our speakers in alphabetical order by surname although they'll be speaking in a slightly different order. So Dr. Helene von Bismarck is a writer, historian and public speaker who I think has become one of the most interesting and insightful commentators on Brexit and on Britain's place in the world. And she brings a number of very interesting perspectives to that. So her first book was about British policy in the Persian Gulf. But she's recently completed a second book. I'm working You're on it. You're almost <laughs> completed a second book on Margaret Thatcher and Jacques Delors, of course, one of the great architects of the modern European Union. And she's written about British policy for the Times, for the British Scholar Society, for the UK and a changing Europe, and a range of other media outlets. Dr. Priyam Vardikapal is a reader in Anglophone and related literatures at the University of Cambridge. And she brings a particular expertise on the histories and legacies of empire and of colonialism. She's published on literary radicalism in India, on the idea of anti-imperial amnesia. And her most recent book, which is for sale in all good bookshops and in the corner over there after this event, is called Insurgent Empire, Anti-Colonial Resistance and British Descent. And it's a really fascinating study that thinks about how ideas move from the colonies to the metropole and not simply as often recounted in the opposite direction. Professor David Reynolds is the Emeritus Professor of International History at the University of Cambridge and someone who's published very widely on Britain and its place in the world. In, I think, 1991, he published a book called Britannia Overruled, British Policy and World Power in the 20th Century, which remains really the core textbook for thinking about British foreign policy in the 20th century and should be essential reading for all policymakers today. But his most recent book is called Island Stories, Britain and its History in the Age of Brexit. It's again going to be available after this event. And it thinks about the stories that are told about the past and the power that they develop in the present and in Britain's Brexit narrative. And uniquely on this panel, David is not on Twitter. So we're going to um, begin with Professor David Reynolds. And then each speaker will have about nine minutes. And then we're very keen to hear your views. So David. Thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to be here. Thank you for coming. Um, the, this book, Island Stories, started because of my concern about the way that I thought history was being used, misused, misrepresented, caricatured during the Brexit debate. And it gradually grew into a feeling that we are, Brexit has 
opened up a whole series of fissures in our national life, our institutions, our practices, which are much more than simply the question of Britain and Europe and raise fundamental questions about where we are as a country historically today. And I want to talk just a little bit in, in two, two ways about both those points. First of all, and briefly, the, the use and misuse of history. One of the things that has concerned me in a number of books, and certainly in, in this book, is um, our, I think, peculiar obsession, unusual obsession as a country with the two world wars. Um, meaning by that, compared with other countries in, who were participants in those wars, major belligerents. And uh, for the first, the First World War is, if you like, interpreted as a tragedy, uh, a tragedy focused on the trenches and interpreted by poets. The Second World War is a triumph, uh, a triumph which has become focused on one year, 1940, a story of standing alone. Um, and I'm not going to go into that in detail. We could talk about it in the questions, but it seems to me it does feed into the, the Brexit debate in many ways, and particularly into our particular narrative of our history in the 20th century compared to that of, if you like, the founders of the European Union. Um, all the countries, the six countries that signed the Treaty of Rome in 1957 were, in a sense, countries that had no interest in dwelling on the Second World War as their finest hour. On the contrary, they wanted to move away from their history, uh, move away from their past and think about something different. And one of the things that I think has been persistently misunderstood in this country is the degree to which the European Union is rooted in a peace project that grew out of that different experience of the, the, the Second World War compared to our own. So we could talk about that if we want. Uh, what I'd like to talk a little more about, um, and it, it takes me on to this question of deeper problems, deeper issues that have opened up, is, if you like, um, the other union, not the European Union, but our own union, the United Kingdom. Because I think that has uh, come under strain and um, uh, in a way that we had not expected, or at least we, and the we in this is often, as it were, metropolitan English Britain. Uh, because one of my concerns in this book is the degree to which we understand the, our, our history from uh, a, an English, London-centred, home counties-centred perspective. Um, so that issues such as the backstop, issues such as Scottish nationalism and so on, um, are, are, are reported often as a kind of surprise or a problem or as a shock and so on, whereas they actually are quite rooted in explicable history, if we think about it in, uh, in a historical sense. Um, and the history is, in a sense, the, the persistent project of English rulers going back to the medieval kings to control these islands, meaning by that this island and the other one, the island of Ireland, always seen as a unit in terms of, of security issues for, for rulers in London. And in particular, the period from the 16th century onwards, and this is connected up with Europe, of course, where the Reformation in this country, the persistence of Catholic, uh, Catholic uh, Christianity on the continent, and a series of wars against uh, Spain, later on France, inscribed in the sense of English identity the notions, as Linda Colley has, has written about and others have written about, that what was distinctive was Protestantism and parliamentary government compared to absolutism, uh, Catholicism and absolutism on, on the continent. And that those notions of what was English identity affected the uh, the sense of what was necessary to be done to control the islands, 
the islands as a whole had to be brought within this project of Protestantism and parliamentary government. Uh, and the notion of a union, a formal union, was not one that was readily embraced by rulers in London. The two celebrated acts of union, 1707 with um, Scotland and 1800, 1801, um, when it came into existence with Ireland, were acts of necessity or perceived necessity arising from security crises with the wars, uh, uh, with wars against France. And there is no historical reason why that union should remain in perpetuity if time and circumstances and conditions change. Now, what I say about the union with Scotland obviously would be disputed by Scottish nationalists, but it seems to me on the whole that was a reasonably profitable uh, union on both sides. Scotland was brought into what is effect, was effectively a common market. In other words, Scottish traders could deal uh, trade with England, and they could also penetrate England's colonies in the Atlantic, which was one of the most important parts of the Atlantic seaboard, West Indies um, Atlantic. Scottish traders were particularly successful in the tobacco trade, for example. Um, Scotland had the capacity to hold its own in the union with, with England because of its own um, uh, commercial resources, its education system, its, you know, the heritage, if you like, of the Edinburgh Enlightenment, all these various things. Um, and it was therefore um, able to hold its own. Ireland was, a was treated as much more of a colonial country, agrarian and um, uh, uh, not developing uh, in the same way its industrial base. And the divergence between the two became apparent in the, uh, the First World War era. Um, the Irish demands for home rule, which were shared in Scotland and also to a lesser extent in Wales, led to a what I would call Great War settlement where Ireland was, Ireland was divided, the island of Ireland was divided, and Britain was consolidated. The strains within the Union in Britain were healed to some degree by the sense of shared sacrifice of Welsh and Scottish regiments in the First World War, the Second World War. The Ireland that settlement, the divided Ireland, the consolidated Britain, lasted, I think, through much of the 20th century until we had, if you like, another settlement, which we've not ever really come to terms with, at least the we, in, meaning home counties, um, in the sense of the sense of um, the devolution agreements in Scotland and Wales, and the uh, Good Friday Agreement in Ireland. Both of those were fundamental changes to the nature of the union. They suggested a completely different, a looser union. And that is the background which has never been really properly explored with which Brexit hit us in 2016. So there is an un, un, uh, there's a, 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 a set of issues about the union and how we handle it, which are there before Brexit. Brexit has um, forced us to face up to, I think, or ought to force us to face up to in a new way. Thank you very much. Helen. Um, well, thanks, Robert, for the introduction. And I'd also like to thank Amrit Swarley and Chatham House for inviting me to this event. I feel very honored to be speaking here and in this company. Um, what is this concept of a global Britain? What does it mean? And what does history have to do with it? Before we tackle this question in precisely nine minutes, I think I must first point out or acknowledge a very basic fact. And this is that there is a significant difference between history and memory. Politically, the latter, memory, is at least as influential 
as the former history, and I think we see this in the debate about Brexit. The hope for a global Britain or global Britain as a post-Brexit strategy is not an inevitable result of Britain's past, or at least so I would argue. It is a political choice which results from the way history has been remembered, interpreted, and also how it has been used rhetorically in the Brexit debate, which arguably began decades ago. In preparation of this event, I looked up statements, articles, and speeches made by prominent and influential Brexiteers like Daniel Hannan, Jacob Rees-Mogg, and indeed the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. And what struck me was how their idea of a global Britain is not just a vision or project for the United Kingdom. It also constitutes the rejection of fancy, Europe. Daniel Hannan, in a speech he delivered at Eastbourne shortly before the referendum, argued that the EU, and I quote directly from his speech, is clearly not no place for a country like ours to find itself in. So what is this place that is so unsuitable for Britain, for global Britain? If we are to understand the idea of a global Britain, we must not only ask how the proponents of this concept view the United Kingdom and its history, we must also understand their perception of Europe and the EU. And this is what I would like to focus on in my remarks today. And since my time is very limited, I'll single out and engage with two prominent arguments in the Global Britain discourse, one about Europe as a continent and the other about the European Union as an organization. Now, Europe and the EU are obviously not the same, but the Brexiteers' rejection of the EU runs deeper than mere discomfort with Britain's participation in the European integration process. Underlying the Global Britain worldview is the assumption that historically the United Kingdom is not a European country, or at least not quite. In stressing the historic ties which the British have undeniably built with large parts of the world over centuries of imperialism, the United Kingdom is presented as a country which has traditionally kept its distance from the messy affairs of the continent and looked outward rather than inward. Now, it would, of course, um, be absurd to deny the enormous importance that Britain's interactions with the wider world have had for this country and indeed the many countries it once colonized. But what I would question, however, is the notion that Britain's imperial history makes it exceptional in a European context, let alone unsuitable for membership in the European <coughs> Union. The main intellectual problem with exceptionalism is, in my view, not so much its perception of Britain, but that it is based on a superficial reading of European history. If Britain is the exception, then what's the rule? What is a normal European country? If you dive into uh, the historiography in Germany about German history or in France about French history, you'll find out that most countries have a historiographic tradition which singles out this country as special, as not quite like the others, and compares it to all the others. Um, so why is Britain so exceptional? And it's by no means, uh, means a criticism. I'm a very fully signed up Anglophile of Britain if I point this out. Why do Portugal and Poland have more in common than Britain and France? Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Austria, France and Italy, they all look back on a history of imperialism. From the point of view of historical methodology, it is highly questionable to isolate the conflicts and diplomatic struggles on the continent from the affairs on the global stage. To give you just one example, the Seven Years' War from 1756 to 1763, which German school children used to study as a conflict between Prussia's famous king, Friedrich the Great, and Austria's Maria Theresia, was in reality an early modern world war in which Prussia and England stood together against Austria and France in a conflict that extended to North America and India. So, if the argument that the UK is just too different from the continent to be an EU member state does not hold up, then maybe it is not so much Europe as a continent, but the European Union as an organization, which is the real problem for the proponents of global Britain. Listening to Jacob Rees-Mogg, who referred to EU membership as a yoke, in the House of Commons, or to Boris Johnson, who wants to rebrand Brexit Day as the United Kingdom's Independence Day, you would think so. A Britain that needs to be unleashed, as current election pamphlets inform us, must have been held in bondage for decades. 
tempting as it would be for me in the face of this rather overblown rhetoric, I think it is important not to dismiss the sovereignty argument for Brexit out of hand. It is plainly a fact that European Union membership limits the United Kingdom's sovereignty, at least, and this is a rather important caveat, if you define sovereignty as the ability to make independent decisions, an ability that ought not to be confused automatically with the power to shape international events. In other words, sovereignty and power are not the same. It is also a fact that the EU as an international structure does contain some elements of statehood. But to describe the European Union as a superstate, or worse, to compare it to earlier violent attempts by Napoleon, Hitler, or the Soviet Union to exercise power over large parts of the continent is factually inaccurate and displays a staggering lack of nuance and proportion, never mind sensitivity. The perception of the EU as an oppressor of the United Kingdom is based on an extremely selective reading of the history of British membership in the European Union. As far as political union was, uh, unity was concerned, it is fair to say the, that the United Kingdom's participation was indeed half-hearted. And the sovereignty argument has always held a lot of sway here. But this does not change the fact that British diplomacy within the EU was often extremely successful. The rebate that Margaret Thatcher secured in the fi fight about the European community's budget and the long list of opt-outs the United Kingdom was granted in the Maastricht Treaty were examples of this. I know that Brexite Brexiteers tend to see the Maastricht Treaty rather differently, but if you ask a French person about the opt-outs that Britain um, uh, uh, was granted, uh, they regard it as a huge British success to get this special treatment, that's a quote. Um, the drama of the last four years should not make us forget that the United Kingdom was much more than just an awkward partner in the integration process. The United Kingdom was an important champion of the single market and Eastern European enlargement. Um, the European Union is what it is today, not just in spite, but also because of the United Kingdom. And I would say that is, this is not a bad track record for hostage, which needs to be unleashed. To conclude, it is not to deny the United Kingdom's global past to point out that the continent will not swim away after Brexit. Neither side will be able to avoid the other for long. When, or if, I think when, but possibly if, Brexit goes ahead, some of its enthusiasts will probably celebrate Britain's return to its natural place, the global stage. But when that happens, it may be worth remembering that the choice between Europe and the world has never been binary for the United Kingdom and that it cannot be expected to be so in a post-Brexit future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> Ria. Thank you, Robert. Thank you also to Chatham House and Amrit Swali for inviting me. Unlike my two colleagues here, I'm not a, a Brexit expert. I was asked to sort of think about uh, the book that I've just published in relation uh, to Brexit. Um, and I'm going to pick up on something David said uh, about uh, the sort of unique obsession here with the two world wars. And I would say that that obsession is matched, on the other hand, by an uh, amnesia around empire and the end of empire. So in a sense, the obsession with the, the Second World War in particular um, replaces or uh, renders the empire opaque. Um, in the book, uh, which is uh, in, uh, polemical in part, I argue that Britain was not the only site in which ideas of freedom and emancipation were theorized, um, and that such things as freedom were generally forged through struggle and resistance and not bestowed from above, even if they were appropriate and repurposed as such later. And my argument um, towards the end of the book is that British public life and political discourse has been mired in a uh, colonial mythology in which Britain, followed by the rest of the geopolitical West, is the originator of ideas of freedom, either bestowing it, as it were, on slaves and colonial subjects, or teaching them how to go about obtaining it. And I draw on the insight of the great abolitionist and former slave, Frederick Douglass, that power concedes nothing without a struggle, and the historical record actually shows us that. The enslaved and the colonized of the empire were not gifted their freedom, but achieved it 
too complicated and protracted struggle. And the second point I make is that they found allies within Britain, British dissidents, on the question of empire and aspects of imperial policy and practice. And I argue, too, that these dissidents were uh, influenced or even radicalized by anti-colonial uh, insurgencies, movements, campaigners, and campaigns. So, in a sense, there's anti-colonialism within Britain and without. And it really interests me, uh, uh, and Helen just uh, referred to this, the ways in which the discourse of anti-colonialism has resurfaced uh, in Brexit. And I'm going to talk about the ways in which uh, that is slightly uh, problematic. But my argument is that there's there can really be no conception of Britain as exceptional uh, or British values as exceptional if you, uh, least of all, liberty and tolerance or even human rights. Uh, you can't really give these a purely insular definition. There were homegrown traditions, uh, of course, but a country with an empire of that size and duration can never just be itself. Um, the famous uh, 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 theorist Franz Fanon uh, spoke about the ways in which Europe is a, literally a creation of the third world, and I would argue that that applies to Britain uh, too. Fanon was speaking about the uh, wealth that was the foundation of Europe. Uh, he was talking about Holland and Bordeaux and Liverpool, um, and I would say that uh, we want to think about the ways in which Britain is the product of its empire, but also the ways in which it is the product of anti-imperialism. I think it's really interesting the ways in which anti-colonial discourse wielded against Britain uh, by the colonies has come back now and is being kind of repurposed in thinking about Britain's relationship uh, to Europe. Um, I'm going to jump now to talking about um, the forgetting or, or the perverse rewriting of imperial history in which Britain, although in some versions uh, aligned with America across the Atlantic, stands alone in the center of the sea in the world, dispensing gifts of freedom and values. And I say that this is one of the mythologies that has never quite gone away, but has been resurrected with vigor in the context of Brexit. In other words, British exceptionalism is founded on a paradox that was also uh, uh, important to the the imperial project. Uh, on the one hand, Brexit is uh, described to us in terms of Empire 2.0, and on the other hand, as an anti-colonial movement uh, against Europe. And I'm, I would argue that this is a paradox that was already at the heart of empire. There are shades of Lord Macaulay's pronouncement that, that Britain, uh, that her peculiar glory, as he put it, was that, quote, she has ruled only to bless and conquered only to spare. And this very interesting appropriation of the language of anti-colonialism today confirms my sense that anti-colonialism in the colonies uh, impacted and was uh, an, an influence uh, on Britain. Brexit, however, is not an anti-colonial project. While nations emerged out of anti-colonial struggles, anti-colonialism is not congruent with nationalism. Indeed, in many cases, nationalism has resulted in an arrested decolonization, replacing the expansive vision, internationalist vision of many of the anti-colonial figures I talk about in my book, uh, replacing that expansive vision with ethno-nationalism. Uh, Hindutva in my uh, uh, home country of Britain is an example. Uh, and this is nationalism, not as anti-colonialism, but as majoritarian exclusivity, racism, religious chauvinism, border making, authoritarianism, and even aspirations to ethnic cleansing. And I would argue that uh, the, the ideology of hardcore Brexiteers has much more in common with this form of majoritarianism and author authoritarianism than it does with anti-colonialism, which was at its heart and at its finest a redistributive project which didn't just seek sovereignty uh, in the narrow sense of replacing one set of elites by another set of elites, but actually wanted to uh, depart from existing templates and existing hierarchies. And my, my view is that even the left-wing argument for Brexit, or so-called Lexit, um, which one presumes uh, would wish to achieve a version of socialism uh, is misguided because anti-colonialism, particularly of the socialist variety, is constitutively internationalist and understands the centrality of alliances and organizing across borders, which Brexit, I don't think, does. So in short, if Britain really does wish to be anti-colonial, and I'm not sure that that is the case, 
if Britain wishes to decolonize, then you would need to channel the spirit of actual historical anti-colonialism. And that project cannot involve myopic inward looking retrenchment nor refuge in some kind of transatlantic special relationship. Europe and Britain would both need to decolonize and this would mean ex embracing internationalism, redistribution, workers' rights, ending racialized borders, not just within Europe, but also beyond. I'll just stop there, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you to all three of our speakers, and especially for keeping so wonderfully to time, which means that we do have a lot of time for discussion. Before I open it up to the floor, it struck me that there were three points that recurred in all three of your remarks, which I would just like to explore a little bit further, and they are exceptionalism, memory, and amnesia. So firstly, and they're obviously related ideas, so firstly, I wonder, is there a danger that we actually construct an exceptionalist history of Brexit in that we suggest that there is something peculiarly pathological about Britain's relationship with its past and Britain's idea of its place in the world, when we might in fact say that Euroscepticism has been rising across much of the continent and that the histories that we should locate this in are perhaps broader populist Western history. So that's just one thought to throw out. A second one is about memory. Is it possible that memories focus on things like the two world wars so extravagantly because Britain has never constructed a positive memory of its time in the European Union? That it hasn't constructed the kind of success story that you might associate with the Wirtschaftsbunder in Germany or that you might associate with de-Sovietization in Eastern Europe? And if so, why Britain has never really constructed a compelling story? I think it was very evident in the Remain campaign that there wasn't a compelling narrative to tell about Britain and Europe. And then just finally, um, on the point about amnesia, Bill Schwartz wrote a wonderful piece recently where he said that Brexit was a crisis of memory, and he talked about this forgetting of Britain's imperial past. So I wondered how remembering empire or remembering it differently might make Britain think differently about its relationship with Europe. And I wondered if any of you would like to respond to any of those points. David. Uh, well, I mean, on the, the point about memory and the argument of, about um, the two world wars and so on, um, yeah, I think it was striking the Remain campaign did not have, did not offer a very strong, enthusiastic mm. uh, vision of Europe. It was, you know, better to stay in on the whole. <coughs> and David Cameron was essentially a Eurosceptic who came to the, that conclusion. But I think um, Ivor Rogers, for example, I think who was our EU man in, in Brussels, um, it brings out, I think, rather nicely that the, the British project was to be within the European Union, if you think of it as a circle, but right on the edge of it, though inside, with the opt-outs and things like that. And possibly the Leave project was to be just outside that circle, but still with the aspiration that you could actually um, engage, you know, get the benefits of a single market and so on. It, it, it's not clear what they uh, imagined. Um, but I think that the, the, the impulse to join was really to say, uh, by, by governments of both parties in the, the 50s who did not think the European project would get off the ground, when it did, there was the feeling that we could not afford to be outside it and the reason for that was not so much economic arguments, which were still evenly balanced. It was that, that if we didn't, there was a danger that our special relationship, quote unquote, with the United States would be prejudiced and Washington would look to Europe rather than to us as its principal interlocutor. So there's always been a sense that we didn't quite intend to be in Europe in the way that we were. And that came out in the Remain campaign. Thank you. Hello. I'm not sure I have your points in the right order, but um, just talking about exceptionalism, well, I think I, I, I've said that in my remarks, but it also, um, the question whether Brexit is pathological, it's certainly, a, I mean, strong word, which maybe isn't very helpful. Um, what I, I would agree with is that it's certainly important to see Brexit, um, to stop isolating it and looking at it as a question of Britain's relationship with the European Union, because in my view, uh, it, it didn't only bring out lots of other problems here on the surface, but it needs, needs to be contextualized in the rise of populism, in the rise of 
and I say that it needs to be contextualized within it. I'm not saying it's happening here, but in the rise internationally um, of strongman policies. Um, and uh, but I still think that there is something peculiar about Brexit in the sense that even um, those uh, on the continent, critics of European integration, they want to change the European Union. They don't want to leave it. Orban doesn't want to leave the European Union. He just wants to reshape it uh, entirely. Um, and as for the question of the two world wars, I mean, that's something which also struck me. And I think it's important to acknowledge that just because some of these arguments are completely overblown and frankly offensive, um, doesn't mean that there isn't some foundation somewhere to them. I mean, it is a fact that Britain wasn't occupied, that there wasn't uh, displacement and occupation and the complete destruction of, of the political system in this country, as there has been in, in the vast majority of U European Union member states. So it's logical that this idea of a peace pro project would be less attractive here than it is in a country like the Netherlands, for example. So, um, but acknowledging that, it is still absurd uh, to compare uh, European integration, uh, I mean, to, to what Hitler did with Europe. And, and uh, so, but I think and that's my last point, goes also to the question of how this debate is, I think we need to talk about the role of the press and the relationship between politicians and the press in this country, the op-ed culture, so to speak. I think it's also something to do with, you know, clickbait culture and everything is happening so fast. Arguments are getting more and more extreme. And we spoke before this panel, we spoke about how we were all annoyed by how history is being instrumentalized and weaponized in this debate and how it's just incredibly superficial. And if you are going to be superficial about history, then please don't make such a crass conclusion. But that's what you see all the time on all sides. Thank you. Um, well, the, the questions have been answered very fully. I actually have never seen Brexit as exceptional. Um, I, for me, I, I've said to people that if people had been paying attention to what had been happening in India from 2014 on, 2014 onwards, neither Trump nor Brexit would have come as a particularly big shock. I would, pre, I would place Brexit precisely in the global rise of extreme right ideologies, majoritarianism, and not just populism, but majoritarianism, authoritarianism, ethno-nationalism, kind of retrenching uh, into, into kind of uh, nationalism of a, of a very unhelpful and myopic uh, variety. So it's not exceptional although there are obviously particularities to, to the British case. Um, so uh, the other point is, uh, how, how does empire make us think differently? Well, for one thing, um, empire 2.0 presumes that there is a grateful commonwealth waiting to receive Britain into her arms. Um, I have not seen that sense anywhere uh, with, with anyone. Uh, the, the commonwealth, as it were, is busy doing its own thing. Um, uh, the, and, and you can only imagine a, a grateful commonwealth if you've really forgotten aspects of empire and the bitterness uh, around aspects of empire that still uh, remain in, in memories in post-colonial context. But the other thing I would say is that internationalism, and I, I'm sorry to say it in this context, uh, it, it didn't just come from Wilson. It isn't a, it isn't a, a Western idea. Uh, internationalism was forged in the crucible of anti-colonialism. So I would like to see a degree of humility when words like colony and yoke and independence and sovereignty are bandied around and a kind of return to how Britain's colonies actually did think about uh, breaking from the colonial yoke and think about what a future uh, uh, after colonialism might look like. And I think that a degree of humility in that narrative might be very helpful. Thank you very much. We, <laughs> we have 20 minutes now for audience questions. So if you could raise your hands nice and high if you'd like to ask a question. Um, I'm going to take them in batches of three so that we can gather questions together. We do have some microphones moving around the room. So when I pick you out, if you could wait till the microphone reaches you and then uh, give us your name, that would be very helpful. It would be great to get through as many people as possible. So if you could keep questions reasonably brief and as questions, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. So we'll start with the gentleman over here. Um, hi, uh, Ned Cedric, member. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, just to touch on the point you just made, um, do we have any friends in the world? Thank you. Uh, and then the lady at the front here. So if we could have the microphone over at the front. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Isabel Hilton, I'm a member of Chatham House. Um, I, I was very interested in uh, memory, amnesia, and all those things, and, and particularly in David Reynolds' uh, comment about this being a home counties problem. Uh, I was brought up and educated in Scotland and certainly find the most exotic element of this whole affair are the home counties, which are completely alien and mysterious to me. But my question is what, um, the question of why Scots remember empire differently, if that is part of your case, is, is, is I think worth, it's not just the nationalists. I think if you look at how Scotland voted in this, it, it's not just an SNP vote. This is a vote which is rooted in a, a, a very different memory and a different sort of cultural sense of who you are in the world, mm -hmm. which, um, which I th I'd like to hear you comment on. Thank you. We'll take one more question again from this side of the room before we move over. There was a gentleman um, over here. Yes, behind you there. Thank you, Hookie Walker, member of Chatham House. Seems to me that the media debate about Brexit has overemphasized the trade and non-tariff barrier side of things, the economic side of things, at the expense of history. And I would like to support uh, what Professor Reynolds was saying about the need for seeing Europe as, um, I forget his words, a peace process, but not just going back to the two world wars, but going back to 1870. 1870, 1914, 1939, we had three terrible wars essentially based on Franco-German hostility. The European Union has bound Europe together in such a way that wars between us are now unthinkable, and on a historical scale, it'll be a huge mistake to break it up. Thank you very much. Shall we take those in reverse order? So, Priya, would you like to kick off? Um, I'm not sure I have a whole lot to say. It, it's, uh, I'm a literary critic, so I'm afraid I have to say it depends on your definition of friendship. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think there are uh, large swathes of... Uh, Britain that have that resonate with people in in both in the Commonwealth and in and in Europe um, But if we think about friendship as Farage and Trump, uh, you know the, the, That's a very different kind of friendship. So I slightly think it depends on what kinds of alliances uh, a, a country wishes to make and and all there are lots of alliances open to Britain, but it you you'd need an expansive uh, vision for that. And I think the other question was addressed specifically to David, so I will uh, cede my place. Um, about the friendship uh, question, you have plenty of friends. It's just that they feel a bit jilted at the moment. Um, and, but, uh, and on a more serious um, uh, uh, notion, I mean, Donald Trump seems to be thrilled with Brexit Britain, and I think this friendship is available. It's the question, what's the price for that friendship? Um, as for the Scotland, I will leave to David Reynolds, um, but uh, as for your comment about the peace project, um, I can just, as a German, uh, wholeheartedly agree with you. On the question of, of Scotland and, and the Union, um, let me just preface what I'm saying by, uh, I was very struck by the, some of the work of, of J.G. Pocock, John Pocock, about the, the islands, and the idea that, uh, and I kind of paraphrase this, but it's the idea that the assumption tends to be we made the union, uh, England shaped the, these neighboring countries, and we have neglected the degree to which those countries have shaped and changed us. And one of the things that struck me in writing this, the particular chapter on, on Britain, was a, a, a slightly throwaway comment in one of Linda Colley's books, where she said that, uh, and I was just trying to find it, um, but you know, that if you take 700 years from probably the mid 11th century to the Battle of Culloden, 1746, in that time, only three English kings uh, or English rulers did not either invade Scotland or try to repulse an invasion from Scotland or do both. So that's 700 years of warfare. And, you know, our, the English perception of, of the Scots' sense of their own nation is that, you know, they get wound up uh, and do Braveheart before, you know, Six Nations rugby game. But if you think about that degree of conflict, that is you know, profoundly significant and important. And it, 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 
it's not surprising that there is a sense of identity, a separate identity, which I was alluding to briefly in my comments, you know, that the Scots maintain that within the Union, within the, after the 1707 Treaty, they also maintain their own legal system, church, and things like that, that that is something that we have not taken serious enough. It's true of Ireland, uh, as people like Fintan O'Toole have brought out, it's true of Wales. Um, so my, my shorthand is, you know, that the, the, the Union made us, meaning the English, as much as the other way around. And the same is true for the Empire. I mean, that in the, if things, the shorthand of the Empire chapter in the book, which I tried to um, pick out, which is that sense, yes, the Empire made what it is to be British as much as the idea that we made the Empire. You know, so this is, this is a plea, this book is in part a plea for a much less parochial view of our history. And as I say, the hour is, if you like, this, and I'm caricaturing here, but a kind of metropolitan way of looking at, well, the whole thing, the whole world, if you like. Thank you. Let's take another round of questions. Um, if you can wave nice and high so that I can see, that would be good. Um, so we'll start with the lady at the back there. Um, I'm Anya. I was wondering if there's a way that we could combat imperial amnesia. Thank you. Um, wonderfully concise question. There's a gentleman um, in a brown jumper over there. That's the one. Uh, Will James. Um, one of the themes of, of memory and forgetting that perhaps hasn't been brought out here seems to me the, uh, the, the perhaps unresolved history we have with our positions of trading nation and the politics of trade in Britain um, over the past 200 years, the, uh, the repetitive theme of, of whether we are an open trading nation or a closed protected country comes from the Corn Laws, the tariff debates in the early 20th century, uh, imperial preference, and then our entry into the EC and our, our departure from the EU. Um, and I wonder whether the panellists have any, any thoughts on why we seem so, so unwilling to reflect or, or analyse that part of our politics and history. Thank you. And I'll take uh, one more question um, from the gentleman by the door there. Uh, Martin O'Neill, I'm a member of Chatham House. I just wanted to ask Professor Reynolds to comment further. I think you started your remarks with sort of this is almost a tale of two unions or the tale of relationships in two unions. And, and what intrigued me is, 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 is there something about the Good Friday Agreement, devolution, that in fact fed the Brexit phenomenon in domestic British politics that, that most of us have missed, frankly. Thank you. Um, Helene, would you like to start? I think I'll leave the imperial amnesia <coughs> question. Uh, you're probably be best equipped to answer that. Um, I think it's, or, and you may disagree, I think it's already happening to a certain extent. I mean, there was this great exhibition about the British Empire at the Tate, Britain, I think last year, for example, which is, I think, an, an example of looking at the history of empire in, in another way. And I think this, this exhibition didn't only deal with the history of empire, but also, by the way, how it's been presented and how it's been remembered in Britain. Um, but, um, and I, I also think that looking at the Brexit debate, you rarely, I mean, you don't have anybody saying openly, let's go back to being an empire. People talk about <laughs> Anglosphere, they talk about being global, they talk about well, being a free... Yes, but it's more this free trading nation, it's more sort of a euphemism for imperialism. Um, so I think this, this idea of amnesia is actually much more prominent than looking at Bre Brexit as a neo-imperialist project. I, I wouldn't look at it that way. I think that the in terms of memory and history, I think that uh, the two world wars are actually more important um, than the empire, but, but that's obviously controversial. We can discuss that. For your free trading question, um, well, I don't really know, but uh, why this is such a prominent um, stereotype, if you will, about British history. I mean, it's of course in part true, but what I will say is it's not just the British who, who say that. I mean, what Napoleon said about Britain, this nation of shopkeepers, that's how um, lots of people have for a long time perceived uh, the United Kingdom. And again, and I think this is, is a general frustration historians have, um, how uh, memory and stereotypes are incredibly hard to to fight and, and, and get rid of. Um, 
speaking about Brexit generally, what I find is that this whole drama of the last three and a half years has actually reinforced stereo stereotypes in the European Union about Britain. So um, people are moving away from a more nuanced view of British history towards a cliche view of, oh, they're just these new imperialists or they're just arrogant. I'm quoting, I'm quoting, okay? <laughs> um, so people um, are so sort of annoyed and enraged and tired by this whole to and fro of Brexit um, that they don't bother so much engaging with the nuance of history and sort of go back to the stereotypical thing, uh, thinking about Britain, Britain, which I find is a huge shame. David. Well, I'll, I'll leave imperial amnesia to some extent to, to Priya, but I mean, it's something I'm really wrestling with in the book because it's something I'm, I am starting to think about, the need for us to really rethink our notion of imperial history if we want to understand our identity. Um, and indeed, this book is really a, a work in progress. I'm, I'm, it's, I'm thinking out loud, and that's been a strange experience of writing a book in that way. But let me address the two questions that were more, perhaps more specifically uh, addressed to me. One was about the, the, um, what I was saying about the Good Friday Agreement devolution and so on. I'm not saying it caused Brexit. What I'm saying is that um, what we had in what my shorthand is the kind of millennium settlement of the late 90s, the devolved governments in Cardiff and, and Edinburgh and a, uh, a tentative, precarious, but signi usually significant uh, moving on of the Irish question. That presaged a much looser United Kingdom. And that trend has been placed in jeopardy by I think, unthinking actions in the process of trying to accomplish Brexit. And that, I think, is, is really worrying and really you know, concerning. And it may be, in some ways, irretrievable now. I don't know. So that's what I'm saying. In terms of the question of trade and open trade, free trade and protection and so on, um, this was something I did start to think about a lot in the book. And I have a, one of the epigraphs is from Lord Palmerston in 1860. And he says, trade cannot flourish without security. Trade cannot flourish without security. And, you know, it is a cliche that, you know, countries become free traders uh, and advocates of free trade when they're strong enough to shape the market. That was our position in the 19th century. It was the American position, the flip-flop in the 1930s, in, in the era of Cordell Hull, was of a country that was suddenly in a position to say, yeah, we can challenge imperial preference. We can challenge the empire project. Um, and so part of my puzzlement, genuine puzzlement as a historian, about Cobdenites like Steve Baker, for example, who do believe, and he's on record as saying, you know, um, free trade will bring us world peace and all the rest of it. I don't think you can embark on a trading project without feeling secure. And it will be interesting to see whether global Britain, unyoked from the European Union, is going to be more able to trade and to trade in an advantageous position I'm historically very skeptical of that. I think Palmerston was right. Trade doesn't flourish without security. It's perhaps interesting there that so much modern Euroscepticism really incubates in the 1990s, mm. which is a moment where you seem to have a world in which yes. global trade is guaranteed mm. and the Washington consensus is very secure. But mm. can I just bring in Priya? Um, oh, um, yes, the, the imperial amnesia question. I mean, one thing I always ask my students to do, and I think that in, in the, particularly in the wake of Brexit, this is important, who is the we? Um, so when we say, you know, how do we do this, or do we have any friends, there are multiple we's in Britain, and Britain is, is, is a diverse enough society now that the we really changes from not just from metropole to beyond, but, but across regions and across communities, cultures, races. Um, but if we really want to examine the British we, then I think the answer to a question like this is very simple. You have to first of all teach the empire. I mean, my students repeatedly tell me that they have no idea, that they've done very, very little. And this manifests, for instance, just in the, in the discourse around Ireland. I mean, it's just, you know, the, the, uh, the Irish, remember very clearly uh, you know what 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 the last 
100, 200 years uh, has felt for them, but it's, it's, it's a privilege within England, and I don't say Britain, I say within England, that it can be forgotten and that can, a, a kind of casual return uh, of, of, of the way in which the Irish are talked about. It seems to me that if there was some basic teaching on Britain's relationship with Ireland, uh, some of this would, would actually be, be very, very different. So what is the answer to a very simple but good question? Read, teach, debate, but talk about the empire, and, and don't talk about the empire like it's just gone away. It has a very, very living, powerful afterlife. Uh, the rest of the world has not had the option of forgetting the empire. And, and again, to go back to India, Kashmir is back in flames, and, and there's no way to understand that situation without thinking about the ongoing life, afterlife uh, of empire. So it's not just a question of, of the past or, you know, uh, Britain no longer being an empire. It's everybody's still very, very centrally situated in that project. Thank you. We've got time for just, I think, a couple more questions. Um, so I'm going to come to the, the gentleman in the middle here um, and the lady at the back over there. So you first, sir. Hi, I'm Steve Cooney, <coughs> excuse me, member of Chatham House, and <coughs> I remember very well Jacques Delors worked with that. But um, <coughs> let me just say just one thing very briefly about um, this fantasy of um, globalism, and, and it, it, I'm an American, as you can tell by the accent, and <laughs> I mean, you can forget about a... Um, um, you know, the, the chlorinated chicken issue and the, all this other stuff that they talk about here and Franken foods. I mean, th that is going to be accepted by the UK if you're going to have a global society. I'm, I'm, that, that's, that's, uh, I'm telling you that. I've worked on U.S. trade policy for a long time, and we're not going to give up this stuff. Um, so, you know, just, 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 just put that in your pipe and smoke it, but uh, you'd better accept it. It's going to happen. Thank you very much. And then at the back, please. Hi, my name is Jackie Rowe. Um, I just had a question based on uh, a remark that you made, Dr. Bismarck, um, right at the beginning about how what we have in common with many other major European states is our imperial past um, as a nation. And I'm wondering how that feeds into this debate. Um, around Britain's engagement with its colonial past, with its imperial history, and to what extent um, are other European nations um, engaging in these in these debates? To what extent is the EU engaging in this debate? Um, and uh, as far as I'm aware, doesn't have any decolonization initiatives in place. And do you think there's any hope that actually removing Britain from that um, club of many ex-colonial powers, do you think that there will be actually more space perhaps for a more honest self-reflection? Or do you think that actually the nature of the Brexit campaign and um, the spirit in which many people voted leave will just write that out of the question and there's not going to be space for that kind of self-reflection? Oh, um, it's a brilliant question. I think, um, and that's actually one of the ma many injustices of Brexit. We are all, because of the political drama, we're all focused on British politics, and we see all these debates and these arguments being put forward. Um, but if we look closely at the way some continental countries have dealt with their imperial past, you'll see that there is also an element of, certainly in Germany, there was for a long time an element of amnesia, but that's also because our past in this century is so horrific that we've concentrated on that and that the empire sort of pales in comparison, if you see what I mean. And the, the focus, I mean, the, the, um, so, and it's just over the last 10 years that there's really been a push at the, also at the universities, at the history departments, to deal more with German imperial history. Now there is quite a lot happening, lots of research going on, and there is a push to put more in school books, you know, get the debate out there. There's a huge debate about the way German imperialism is going to be presented in German museums, for example. So at the moment, this debate is really happening, but that's a recent development. Um, uh, so in, in Germany, I mean, obviously, the empire is a lot smaller, but um, it was uh, compared to, I mean, Britain spoke a lot more and dealt a, w a lot more with, with its imperial past than Germany has. 
The question is how. Um, what I find interesting is the example of France. Um, um, Macron uh, gave an interview to The Economist last week, which uh, made a lot of waves, in which, because he said that NATO was brain dead and now everybody's up in arms. But uh, what I found interesting, as someone who's also been an imperial historian, he spoke about uh, France's overseas um, territories and colonial history, past, and he said that this past was actually the reason why France was primed to be an international broker on the global stage and to play a larger role, uh, role on the world stage. And I found that fascinating because just, you know, insert France for Britain, and this is just Brexiteer language, really. And I found that fascinating. So there is absolutely, or in that interview, you didn't see any sort of being apologetic in any way for French imperialism. So um, you're absolutely right that it's not like... Um, the, the countries of the country, uh, continent are naturally want to talk about you know, how you deal with your past. It's just that there are different conclusions drawn from it when it comes to European integration. Just fi uh, finishing up on the question on the European Union, I think that this is very much, in a way, a, a national issue in the sense that the debate will probably take place and has to take place in the individual, individual countries before you'll see some kind of joint effort. That's what I would expect anyway. And I don't think that Britain leaving or remaining in the EU will make much difference on that score, actually. Thank you. Can I just request one final quick thought, perhaps, from the panel? We were asked at the outset to think about the future as well as the past. We've talked about, perhaps, our criticisms of how the past has been used in foreign policy. But what, would, what can history or historical understanding contribute to rethinking Britain's place in the world after Brexit? <laughs> Or does anyone have any thoughts on that? I would like us to think about our history in a much more comparative way, mm -hmm. uh, to be more aware of the history of other countries and the way that, as we've been talking about, they have wrestled with, in some ways, similar problems. Um, for me, it's that kind of, if we could break out of a certain narrowness in, a, in the way we think about our history, that would be, I think, a really creative part of the process. Thank you. I, I would fully agree with, um, you know, I think it's very important, this comparative perspective. And I think that language learning is also really a very important question. And if you talk about how you tackle that in the long term, what you teach in schools and so ever and so forth, I mean, being able to, to, to look at different viewpoints, language learning is just, just a huge issue. Well, um, it's been amply covered. I'm in complete agreement with uh, my colleagues here. I will say that the world needs to decolonize. Um, the world is in a state of arrested decolonization. I don't think, uh, going back to the previous question, that Europe is an innocent, uh, self-evident entity. Europe has its own reckoning to make, uh, and, and the former colonies have their own reckoning to make. So looking towards the future, I think we need to initiate a demanding process of decolonizing across the globe. Thank you. I think we're out of time there. That's a very good place to stop. But thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you for your questions, and thank you to our panel.